This week on the St. Paul Forum, I'm speaking with Terry Thomas, the director of Small Sums, a nonprofit in St. Paul. That's this week on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm Catherine Reed Day, and joining me this week is Terry Thomas, the director of Small Sums. Welcome, Terry. Hi, Catherine. Good to see you again. So um, we met because I we, well, we can't quite figure it out, but your organization came into my consciousness somewhere in the last five years, and I was just so excited about the mission and the purpose and how direct and tangible your work is. So I'd love for you to just describe briefly what Small Sums is. Well, Small Sums, we are a small nonprofit. We're kind of a niche nonprofit because what we do is we provide assistance to homeless individuals who've just gotten a job who think they need to take the job. So often people kind of forget that there's a whole set of perhaps obstacles if someone is homeless, gets a job offer, that, they, that might stop them from being able to get back on the employment, get back to being employed. And we so strongly believe that employment is such a key factor to getting out of the homeless situation. So at Small Sums, what we do very quickly and very nimbly is we step in and provide, usually people need a set of work clothes, work shoes, a bus pass, and if they're in the trade, they need tools. And oftentimes, that can be a barrier that stops them from being able to take a job because they simply don't have what they need to start. So we work with about over 80 referring agencies, plus we work for people, with people who hear about us from word, word of mouth. And if they ha get a job offer, we have the stuff for them so that they can start their job, oftentimes within a day or two. That's so personal and intimate and yeah. practical, and I love it. I think that's what is so appealing about what you're doing, because you've kind of got this two-part, um, first of all, there's the recognition that work is important, and somebody's helped people find those jobs. So yeah. there's that whole relationship side, which isn't your work, as you said. That's correct. So there's this whole army of people helping the homeless find their jobs. And then there's this moment when what if, so there's this great anticipation of getting the job. And then like you, I think that's what got me about your organization was, and then if all that's standing in the way is the bus pass, or a pair uh, of steel toe uh, boots, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so um, how did the idea come to form this well, organization? Well, so, that's so interesting, and I want to, we work with lots of those organizations, as you say, who help people, who are helping people kind of get their lives pulled back together. But oftentimes, they don't have the funding, nor it turns out, the expertise to know, or the nimbleness to be able to help someone who has that job. So about 11 years ago, in 2004 or five. Um, Mark Margolis, who's our board, um, who's our founder of our organization, was working over at PSP, the family shelter in Minneapolis, and he was people serving people, people? serving people okay. serving people, mm -hmm. and he ended up talking with lots of clients who said, "I could work, but I don't have a bus pass to get to work, or I don't have what I need for work." He was really frustrated by it. He was a, an mm -hmm. entrepreneur. He was terribly frustrated by it. He went out to the East Coast for a conference later, sometime shortly after that, and heard of another organization out there that was doing this thing of just exclusively helping people with what they needed for work. He came back to Twin Cities, talked to a couple of other his entrepreneur friends, and they formed the organization. Mm, fantastic. So very pragmatic, which I, I love it. Again, Minnesotans, aren't we just utterly pragmatic? Well, you know. So um, how did you decide, uh, I'm interested in sort of like you say, a steel toe pair of boots, um, the tools. Mm -hmm. How did that piece come together? How did you figure out what was what people really needed? important? What did they need? Well, and it's like you said, one of the things is, is that we deal with people one at a time. Mm -hmm. So after you've been doing this for 11 years, you end up knowing when someone comes to you and says, I gotta start, I've gotta start a restaurant job or I have to start a factory job. We end up, we know that if they're a, that a restaurant job, if they're in food service, they're going to need black no-skid shoes. 
83% of our clients need bus passes so they have a reliable way to get mm. to work. That the, the transportation thing, if you're homeless in the Twin Cities, usually you may be at a shelter, you may be sleeping on somebody's couch, most commonly you're doing a combination of things. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really know where you're going to be to get to work the next day and most don't have cars. So we know that a bus pass is takes away not only the uncertainty of being able to get to work on time, but for us, we could go a step further with this because we work with folks that we do an unlimited one month bus pass so they don't have to decide if they're gonna go to the grocery store, if they wanna go to a friend's, or they are gonna go to work. They can do whatever they need to do and that's just part of the, part of the burden of, and the dauntingness of being homeless is all the stuff you have to carry around by your, on your cell, on your person. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of complications. And so for us, that bus pass, it says, do what you need to do mm -hmm. and, and get your life back together. So we, those are the kind of pieces of, that yeah. we pull together for people. And it's just because we sit down and talk with every one of them. This year we'll serve almost 550 people. So those, that's 550 stories of tell us about your job and what are you gonna do and what do you need for your job. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's uh, roll it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's do a little context. How many homeless are there in the Twin Cities? Do you know that yes. number? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, on any given night, there's 4,700, according to the Wilder study that does that one snapshot night. The Wilder Foundation, the Wilder Foundation which happens to be located here in, in, in St. Paul. St. Paul. Right by our office, actually. I can uh, see them out my okay. window. Um, on any given night, they say that there are 4,700 adults who are, are homeless in the Twin Cities Metro. We expect, we estimate that of, the 40, of that 4,700, we estimate that there are probably about 200 every month that are homeless and have found a job and um, probably need, and need our help. So we look at our, and so probably half of them need some help with their work stuff. So for our universe, we probably think there's about 1,000 to 1,200 people annually in the metro that are in that situation mm -hmm. of needing mm -hmm. a job and ready to do it. So that's mm -hmm. what that's where we're headed. That's kind of your, you can sort of quantify your, your target, if yes, you will. Yes, uh, with, yeah. Yeah, and so again, that's, it's helpful to kind of uh, take it down, scale it back down, and, and you're focusing on adults. Obviously, yes. their children are affected. A third of the homeless people in the, in the, in the entire state of Minnesota, a third of home, the homeless population are, are the dependent are the, children. Yeah, dependent children. So obviously, if you're helping one of those adults, yes. you're probably also helping some number of those 46 children. Forty-six percent of our clients have dependent children. Yeah, so well, almost half almost of our half. have children, too, so yeah. So how, so there's, I know you said that to me, uh, there are these relationships that you have with the other agencies, yes. so this niche, so there's this army over here that are yes. doing all the things that get them ready. Right. So tell us a little bit about how those relationships work. Our partners, if you're in a homeless situation, sometimes there's a, it's a complicated, it's complicated how it all happened, and so there's so many issues that they may be dealing with, struggling with, and so we go reach out to, as I said, over 80 organizations in the metro that whether they're at a, sh whether a shelter, they may be at a shelter, they may be at an employment training program like say Twin Cities Rise, Goodwill Easter Seals, Ujama Place, um, other, place other organizations that serve the poor, that uh, the part of their base is, are homeless. And as I said, they don't always, they don't always have de designated funds to buy steel toe boots. Um, but um, but they do help their clients get to that path. We step in and help them with the work thing, but we rely on the, the relationships they also the clients also have back with those partner referring agencies, so that when they do get enough money for a, a, a deposit, they can help them find housing. So it's just that the more of us that are in place to help them with the supports they need to get back on steady footing, um, the better. Yeah. And so we just. It's a love fest. We love our partners, <laughs> and they love us because we do something really quickly. Oftentimes, our clients, as I say to people, they don't get offer letters and they're gonna start in two weeks. They get called on Tuesday morning and they have to be at work on Thursday in black, in black work pants and either, like wow. I said, no st steel toe boots or no skid shoes. So we have very little time to get them. So we keep 125 pair of no skid shoes and steel toe boots in our kitchen office. <laughs> and we have bus passes, so 
We, it's not uncommon for us to have someone apply for, apply for the job. We verify everybody's job before we do it. Then they come in. We can sometimes, if someone, they apply in the morning, if they're starting third shift at 10 p.m., we'll have them outfitted by 10 o'clock. It's one of the first things we look at when an application comes in is what time, when do they start? Wow. How, it, so, so whatever they need, we will make sure that, they're, that they step onto the job on their first day ready with what they need. Mm. How many people are working with you on this? We have a small staff. Yeah. So there are three of us that are full-time that do that, and then we have two part-time people, and then we have interns who help us as well. Mm. So it's, we're, we're, we're lean and we're small, and mm -hmm. we... Uh, and where are you officing? Our board member, Al Brown, who owns Cheapo Records, has a warehouse on University, and so we get office space donated there. Oh, nice. Yeah. Right, and that's where you're close to Wilder then. That way. We're right by Wilder, right on the Green Line, so clients can take the bus right, or take the train fabulous. right to us and step up. Yeah, we're yeah. Right. oh my gosh, yeah. Well, the Green Line has, sure has been, tra so you've been able to, you're, you said you've worked for six years, so you've um, sort of watched the Green Line... Well, the, the, bus, the bus get dug. Yeah. And the yeah. Oh yeah, no, we had the all right out in front of the thing. But we the always had the buses right. right there too. So we ride on University, mm -hmm. so we're convenient that way, and mm -hmm. people can get to us. Yeah. And um, yeah. So um, you know, I, I just the idea that something so simple as a as a bus pass or a pair of boots is going to make all the difference. Um, what else have you found is is really crucial for these people coming back to work? What else have you? Um, Learned about their their situation. I think that the I think the important thing to think about to understand is the if you're homeless. There's some factors that just that people don't think about about if, if you're if you're looking for jobs. So you're homeless and you don't have a job. You carry most of your your papers around with you. Your belongings are either strung out or in storage somewhere. So that's a tricky factor. And the other piece about being homeless is is that you never get a good night's rest, mm -hmm. and you never have downtime mm -hmm. to recharge and restore. If you're in a shelter, you're always around lots of other people. So there's both a fatigue factor and a stress factor that's added on top of everything else. And so when we have clients come in, and that's just one of the things I love is, if we have clients, they are often being told by lots of different people what they need to be doing. When they come to us, we're like, you've done. You've done what you need to do. How can what can we give you to help you keep oh. going down this path? Mm -hmm. So we kind of we feel like we have a very special relationship because we're just kind of celebrating them and appreciating what they've done. And in their day-to-day -day life right now, they're not getting a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably one of the most satisfying things. And um, and I think we do a really good job of it because we really are pleased and happy for them, and we just want to help them with getting getting yeah. back on track. Yeah, and I'm curious, um, do you only provide like the first month bus pass or is that something that you will extend if, they, if, if they keep If they keep um, working, um, they can come back and get two more bus passes um, so that they can keep them being stable. Get them, get them stabilized a little bit as they're catching up with mm -hmm whatever's happened in their lives yeah. yeah that's really that's great so and and so that's about as long a relationship as you're going to have is that maybe We'd, three months yes or is it, it, yeah that's exactly right mm -hmm. and then if they get oh the other piece is is that if they do get into um when they get into stable housing they come back and we give them what we call a, a, a welcome home package so we give them a little gift card to go to goodwill so they can buy dishes or plates yeah. or things that they um or cleaning supplies things that they might need to move into their new place um we get to um we, give, we just have a couple little a little things. So we have a little, give them a little gift basket of things for moving into their new place wow. and stay connected. And then every year, we go back and to go back to the clients of the previous year to track where they are and how they're doing, which is actually the other piece that's so great for us. So, um, so we go back after, at the, after a year. We go back and ask them, "Are you still work? What's your housing situation? Are you still working? And how much are you making an hour?" So that we can track whether the wage thing is different. And so, we do. We're able to survey about 40. 40 this year, we were able to do 40 percent, reach 40 percent of um, last 2015 clients, and 60 percent of them are in stable housing now, so they're no longer homeless and still working. Wow, that's, so that's we really, really good numbers. Those yeah. are really good numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think that's not, you know, it's, it's a hard path back. There's so many obstacles, you know. Yeah. I think uh, a number of people may have listened to, there was a, they profiled a young woman 
uh, a, a St. Paul school student on public radio and really told her story about helping her try to get graduate and homelessness was one oh. of her factors and those people who followed her story it just got more and more dramatic they, the reporter lost touch with her there were all kinds of communication issues and um, so many things happened to her I, I, but it, it became like a serial uh, drama um, that we were following and it built this relationship where people thought I need to figure out how I can everyone wanted to help her yeah but they began to also see how vast those obstacles were for her, how dramatic they were how easily she slipped out of yes. those intentions including how difficult transportation might be the, the exhaustion factor yes. um, and I think uh, I think one of the things I've appreciated in knowing your organization is the way you You've built uh, an empathy or um, opened open people's eyes that that even and it goes back to your name, small sums that small things do make a difference. Yeah. And I think people tend to throw up their hands and say it's just too big a problem, so I'm not going to do anything. And, and it is a, it is a big problem, and it is a complicated problem. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we just do the thing where we're just going to show up and do our piece, and that goes also back to. And we're going to have our. We're going to trust that our partners are doing their piece. Mm -hmm. You know, if everyone does their part, and greater minds and collective minds are looking at it, because I don't think anyone would disagree that homelessness is, un, is is that it's not complicated. It is, and there's so many factors that influence why it happens. I believe that the way to approach it is not that we're going to end it. But that we're gonna that people that if if it happens and people if things fall apart and pe things do fall apart people are messy and complicated and things happen and it's either either it's bad judgment or bad luck or bad health or just whatever if we can help people kind of re regather themselves and get back on track some people never will be able to do it because the obstacles are too good but plenty will mm -hmm. and we don't know which ones they are but if they just need a handful of things to get on track. Then we're going to be there to do it. When we did those, when we do that follow-up project, mm -hmm. the four of us, the intern and the three staff people, we call everyone. And so, we're on the. I'm on the phone talking with them, and I'll say, "This is so, this is Terry Thomas, and we're calling to follow up." And I would have clients explaining to me what a big difference it made. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. I was like, "Yeah, well, that's I kind of know." Um, but they're like, "This just made. It may not seem like a big deal to you, but that bus pass made a huge difference." Cool. <laughs> If you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Terry Thomas uh, with Small Sums, a nonprofit working with homeless in St. Paul in the Ramsey County and metro area. So um, I want to go back to uh, the dramatic moment at the end of last year when um, I had become a donor, so I'm on your list, and I got, uh, I don't know if it was both an email and a personal letter, but I, I want to compliment you. You do an awesome job of thanking people. Thank uh, so uh, I want to appreciate that, too, as a donor. But the um, you had this incident. Uh, so tell the story of the, the, the break-in. It's quite a dramatic story. I, we couldn't have made it up. Um, <laughs> on Christmas, sometime between Christmas Eve at 5.30 and before the snow fell at 6 o'clock on Christmas Day, someone took a rock and went through our kitchen window at our office and broke in and burglarized, ransacked and burglarized our office. And they, we had a little safe where we had the bus passes in. So they got the bus passes. They stole a laptop. They stole about $4,000 worth of stuff. The next day, one of the warehouse guys from Cheapo came in on that Saturday after Christmas. And there was our broken window. And it was glass and snow. So I went over, and, and Al called me. And I went over, and we cleaned up a little bit. And I thought, oh, we, and we boarded up the window. Um, and then on Monday, we cleaned up. And on Monday night, I sent out an email. I took some pictures of the ransacked yeah, offices. that's what I remember. What's the email and, I got? Um, and had a couple pictures in it. And um, the next day, reporters started calling. And um, you know, who somebody had robbed a place that served the homeless on Christmas Day. Who would do that? And so the reporters came. And so that first, so two stations came, did a story on us about the about the burglary and um, the reason I'd sent out the letters is that they'd taken all the bus passes I had just six in my purse and it was mm -hmm. you know it was the week between Christmas and New Year's we were still seeing clients and I'm like okay we're gonna have to go buy some bus passes so I thought okay I'll send out a letter seeing if people can help with the bus passes so the stories were went on the air about what happened and then suddenly 
we were, we were smothered with love because people started sending us checks. They were calling and saying, what can I do? Someone do said, well, I want to donate a security system to you. So in the end, we had about $4,000 worth of stuff stolen, and we had over $30,000 donated to us. We doubled our donor base. Thousands of people in the Twin Cities learned about what we did. And one of the things that was so touching for me is, is initially people were like, who would do that to an organization that's homeless? And I'm like, well, I don't think the burglar even knew what we did. But then there was this little switch where people started saying, wow, I love what you do. I, I want to support that. Mm -hmm. And it really just, it shepherded us into 2016 with so much goodwill and extra money to serve more people. And every year, for the last three years, we have been able to go adding an, a more, 100 to 150 new um, clients that we can serve. And that solidly put us into 2016. We're kind of hoping that, and the momentum, we're kind of hoping we can keep going with that momentum mm -hmm. for 2017. We continue to grow until we hit that 1,000 to 1,200 point. That's fantastic. I sat there that day thinking, well, who can I ask you know, to, to join me. You know, who can jump on this bandwagon? Who do I think would like this story? And um, there were just a number of people who came to mind that I've never solicited before in any way, but who were people who I think are kind of skeptics and, and maybe a little removed, um, like the fact that people go to work, you know, yeah. want people to work, which is one of your pluses, I think. Um, and it, I, I, I honestly don't know if they ended up donating, but it was really fun just to sit there and think, I'm going to go after a couple of people. I'm going to add a few people to my list and ask them to, to jump in right now. And I'm just guessing I was totally not the only person who did well, that. And that's so funny, Catherine, because what's interesting for me is, is that the, poli the politics of the people who support and like what we do is just across the board. Yeah. Because people do really get a sense of, there are people who really love that self-sufficiency, yeah. bootstrap sort of thing. There are other people that say, oh, these are just practical matters. Mm -hmm. Of course this person is tired and, they, yeah. and, they, and I don't want them having to decide if they could go to the store or go look at an apartment or get, have a bus pass, you know, money for work. Right. So we, get it, we just really, so Democrats, Republicans, and everything in between um, are really like that. It's just whether it resonates, whether right. that, that job thing resonates for people. So you mentioned Al again, who's the founder. And the, so I'm interested in um, how have they, you know, what, uh, they had this idea. Yes. Uh, you said they were entrepreneurs. They've stayed with it yes. um, as your board members. Yes. And what, in what ways, uh, what are their ideas? Do they have some vision for what they would like to do? Has it fulfilled their initial vision? What? You know, How we're having you a, we're actually having a retreat in a couple of weeks to talk about where we're going because we are so at this point, we're really we do this really well, and I think that part of the the pride that they have now, Mark Margolis is our founder, and Al Brown oh, is our that's our building. Landmark, He's yes. our building, mm -hmm. and he, they're both on the boards. Okay. Um, but what I think is that we are at a place right now where we are are serving more people than we ever have. We really are reaching partners so that they, we, they know we're a resource for them to send clients to us. So for us, we're just like, we just want to get to that maximum. We want to serve everybody we can. And I think that's kind of mutually, th th that's our shared vision of we're doing this really well with our shoe shelves and our relationships and our speedy response and, um, and the love we have. We have a, I have a great staff. We, people just, I mean, we just love them. We love them. We lo they show up. And we love, and it's just a great, it's a great job. <laughs> you know, I want to mention because um, one of the things I was thinking about with my family, we're in a transition that, with a, a daughter off in college, and you know, I'm an empty, you know, empty nest. So you start to think about your community relationships and what could we do together as a, you know, what would my husband and I do together? So we have for many, many years always had food in our car for homeless, you know, for panhandlers essentially. Uh -huh. So we see some by the freeway. We don't give money usually. We, we might have something, you know, I have another friend who gives socks out. Yeah. You know, so we, we kind of have trained and thought about ourselves in that way. But I noticed one of the things you had on your list yeah. um, with your solicitation was 
to right. come in and do the packaging. Yes. So could you speak to that sure. idea? And I don't know if there are other volunteer opportunities. Yeah. Yes. Um, we working with the Dignity Center, which is one of our partners over in Minneapolis, and then Union Gospel is a part of this piece too, is we created a thing called a roadside kindness packet. And it's exactly in the spirit of what you, mm -hmm. you do with the thing. And so, but we added a little kick to it. There's many churches will do that. They'll put a little baggie together that has say a granola bar. And what we put in it is a granola bar chapstick. Um, lotion, a little hand lotion, and um, but the other thing we did was we put in contact information for someone if they are indeed panhandling about resources if they do need some help mm -hmm. getting things pulled together. So we put in contact information right. for the Dignity Center for Union Gospel, and the other piece we did is we also put in a list of the food shelves that don't require a permanent address. Most of the food shelves are organized in the Twin Cities geographically, and it makes sense that you go to the food shelf where you live. Well, if you're homeless, you don't have a piece of mail or a driver's license with an address, but there are a handful of, shelf, of, of food shelves that will serve you that way. So we put that list in, and so that's the roadside kindness packet. Nice. We bundle it up, and then people can carry it in their car, and they can give it to it. Sometimes people put, will put a dollar in it or do a mm -hmm. thing. But I, I'm the same way. I don't do the money thing, but I do that. So they get a granola bar. And so we have actually, usually what we do is we have church groups or um, community groups that want to do it. So we'll come to them and we'll have a big, oh, you bring we it have a roadside home. kindness packet nice. party. Fun. And, um, and we fun. do that. Well, that'd be a great thing. And so I think, you know, one of the things we'll be putting up is ways to contact you. Yes, and um, I know that uh, we had hoped to get this tape sooner, but you do have a major event yeah. this next week. So why don't you speak to your event? Okay. Um, on next Tuesday, on November 1st, we're having a, a luncheon. It's a complimentary luncheon, but it's a fundraising luncheon. And R.T. Ryback is coming. He's our guest oh, speaker. Fun. And we will always do, and the thing that people always Former love Former mayor of Minneapolis and now president of the Minneapolis Foundation. That's, yes, exactly. Sorry, just and, everyone knows R.T., but okay. I just say that anyway. <laughs> and so R.T. will be doing the other speaking, and then the two other speakers are two of our clients who will be speaking, which is always I, most people, I, most the people best. say they're, the, the client speakers are their favorite part of the Absolutely. part of the program. So we will have um, we'll have that event, and it really will kick off the last part of the for the rest of the drive for the rest of the year. Because our goal really is is that next year I'd like to be able to serve seven to seven hundred and fifty people. And what would that you know what kind of financial increase are you looking for? You want another thirty thousand dollar bump? I'm hoping that forty thousand dollars will happen. I'm hoping that forty thousand dollars will happen next Tuesday at our event. I'd like to get to a hundred and twenty thousand dollars for next year so that we'll be able to get that to do that extra um, yeah. to be able to have staffing to grow into doing that many people is there uh, uh, one just very quick very quick story that you have of anyone that comes to mind that you're thinking about maybe a preview of of someone speaking next week yeah um, we actually we've got I've got a fellow who is um, he is on both sides of the river. He stays at Higher Ground, um, which is the Dorothy, the Catholic Charity Shelter, men's shelter over in um, um, Minneapolis. And he works at Regents Hospital as a surgical tech. And he um, lost his job. He was laid off. He was doing, he worked at a hospital um, in 2014 and got laid off. And he went through his pension, his lease expired. And he thought, okay, I, I, it won't be long for me, it won't be long for me to, um, get back to work and so I'm not going to renew my lease and so he went to a shelter and kept looking for work and just was not able to find work and it kind of it has spiraled it it just kept going so finally back in April he finally found a job and he was able to come to us and so we helped him with work things that he needed to take the job and um, he's moving into his own apartment no, this great. month that's fantastic. So it, it's people like him. We just get tons of those stories. It's yeah, just sure. it's delightful, and they're always so happy. And they know when they showed up, when we helped them in the first place, that we were so happy for them for their job. So the next step, which is when they come back in and they've gotten their own place, that they just come back in to share their happiness about it, That's too. And great. we're all for that. I love that full circle. Well, thank you so much, Terry, for oh, joining us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and come again next week on the St. Paul Forum.